When we think of elephants, one of the first things that comes to mind is their iconic tusks and the countless uses we've seen in movies of all kinds. But did you know that they haven't always looked as we might imagine today? From the tiny ancestors of elephants to the towering giants we know now, tusks have undergone some of the strangest transformations in the animal kingdom. Let's take a look at some of the different shapes, numbers and sizes of tusks throughout proboscidean history. Our story starts with Erytherium, the oldest known member of the elephant family, Proboscidea. Living about 60 million years ago, this little creature was far from the tusked giants we know today. Imagine something the size of a rabbit, about 20 centimeters or 8 inches tall, scurrying through the forests of ancient Africa. And not only was there a size difference, it didn't even have tusks or a trunk. However, it laid the groundwork for the evolution of the iconic beats we know and love. Fast forward to around 37 million years ago, and we meet more Ethereum. This animal was about the size of a modern pig, 70 centimeters or 27 inches tall, and had a body that looked more like a taper or a pygmy hippo. While Morotherium doesn't look much like a modern elephant, there were some early signs of the elephant-like features that would develop later. It had a broad, flat skull and slightly forward-facing nostrils, which might indicate the early stages of trunk evolution. Although it didn't have the long, flexible trunk we associate with elephants today, it's likely that Morotherium had a short, muscular upper lip likely for grabbing aquatic plants in the swampy environments that it lived in. But Moeritherium left the trunk growing to the Paleomastodon, which appeared around one to four million years later. This new proboscidean pioneer took things more than one step further. Not only did it have a recognizable trunk and a small pair of tusks in its upper jaw, something we're familiar with from modern elephants, it also sported a second pair of tusks in its lower jaw often referred to as chin tusks. These lower tusks were shorter and flatter than the upper pair, but they were still highly functional. Marks on fossils of these tusks indicate they were heavily used, likely for scraping bark off trees, digging into soil to unearth roots, or even scooping up aquatic vegetation in swampy environments. The lower tusks, along with its trunk, allowed Paleomastodon to explore a broader range of food sources than earlier species like Murotherium. This configuration of four tusks instead of two would go on to become a hallmark of many proboscideans that followed. From Paleomastodon sprang an incredible diversification of tusk designs, like the unique downward curving tusks of our next guest, the Dinotherium. This animal was much closer in size to an elephant than our previous guests, up to four meters or 13 feet tall and weighing 12 tons but its tusks were remarkably different. Dinotherium lost the upper tusks that Paleomastodon would have had, but kept the chin tusks, resulting in two long curved tusks originating from the lower jaw. Their uses would have been similar to their ancestors for digging and scraping, but on a more noticeable level. This is rather interesting because it shows a benefit for both of the upper and lower tusks independently, as well as together resulting in a variety of different combinations throughout history. One extreme case of this diversity is a species called Stegotetrabellodon, with lower tusks almost as large as its upper ones. But the combinations continued to vary over time. This is shown slightly further down the line when Mastodon arrived, with just the upper tusks, looking much more like the elephants we see today and standing at 2.9 meters or 9.5 feet. It was similar in size too. But just as it looked like nature was finding the perfect mix of tusks, two on the upper jaw, the Gomphotheres arrived. Once again, just like their ancestors and the OG Paleomastodon, they had four tusks. Now Gomphotheres are not technically elephants, but still belong to the Proboscidea family, along with the other groups, Dinotherium and true elephants. While Dinotherium were the first to make it out of Africa and into Eurasia, Gomphotheres went one step further on their global adventures and made it across to the Americas. As the first to arrive, they were very successful in this new habitat and survived for around 10 million years. Standing at approximately 2.5 meters tall, or just over eight feet, they're similar in size to Asian elephants of today. Among Gomphotherium's descendants was the incredible Platybelodon, 
which lived between 16 and 11 million years ago. This proboscidean took tusk specialization to a whole new level. It had short upper tusks, but its lower tusks were flattened into wide, shovel-like blades, perfectly suited for what is thought to be a semi-aquatic lifestyle. Similar to the paleomastodon, but on a more obvious scale, the lower tusks were certainly a weird feat of evolution and showed up in other animals like Ambelodon. Around 10 million years ago, another Gomphotherium relative emerged, Rhynchotherium. This genus represents a fascinating transitional stage in proboscidean evolution. While Rhynchotherium began moving toward the more streamlined, modern design seen in elephants, it also retained small functional lower tusks, an evolutionary holdover from its ancestors. Its upper tusks were more prominent and likely used for digging, scraping and defense, while the smaller lower tusks may have been used for manipulating vegetation or digging shallow soil. Unfortunately, Rhynchotherium faced fierce competition when mammoths crossed into the Americas along the Bering Strait. As temperatures dropped and the Ice Age set in, forests retreated, giving way to vast grasslands. Mammoths, with their specialized teeth for grazing and robust adaptations to colder climates, had the upper hand in these open environments. Over time, they began to outcompete Rhynchotherium in the Americas, leading to its eventual decline. Of course, mammoths had the same two prominent upper tusks as modern-day elephants, a hallmark of the later proboscideans. This design became a dominant feature across the proboscidean family, including species such as Notiomastodon. Living in South America around 11,000 years ago, Notiomastodon had lost its lower tusks entirely, likely as an adaptation to a grazing lifestyle. With the spread of grasslands, feeding on tough vegetation became more important than the browsing habits of its ancestors, leading to this tusk simplification. But mammoths weren't the only pressure on the Gomphotherium family. Around the same time, humans began to spread into these regions, introducing a new and deadly competitor. Armed with tools and hunting strategies, humans began killing large proboscideans, including mammoths, Gomphotheres and other relatives. This relentless hunting pressure caused a severe decline in many proboscidean species, driving several to extinction. However, the story of elephants doesn't end with this decline. The first true elephants, part of the genus Primelephus, had already evolved before mammoths became dominant. Primelephus represents a key step toward the elephants we know today, including the mammoths mentioned earlier. While it still retained small chin tusks from its Gomphotherium ancestors, these were becoming less functional and were gradually phased out. The animal increasingly relied on its larger upper tusks, which were straighter and more robust than those of earlier relatives. Interestingly, Prime Elephus reintroduced a trait from much earlier proboscideans. It had four tusks, a result of its evolution from the Gomphothea lineage. In addition to its upper tusks, Prime Elephus also had vestigial chin tusks, though these were smaller and less functional. This combination highlights its position as a transitional species, bridging the gap between the multi-tusked proboscideans of the past and the two-tusked modern elephants. The upper tusks of Prime Elephus were straighter than the elegantly curved tusks of later mammoths, suggesting it was still in an evolutionary middle ground. As Prime Elephus evolved, its descendants, including mammoths and modern elephants, refined the streamlined two-tusk design we recognize today. These tusks, perfectly adapted for digging, foraging and display, would become an enduring hallmark of the majestic proboscidean family. But to make things even more interesting, modern elephants are now being seen more and more frequently without tusks. This phenomenon is most prominent in African elephants particularly in regions where intense poaching has occurred over the last century. Poachers have long targeted elephants for their ivory, removing individuals with large, well-developed tusks from the population. Over time, this has created a strong selective pressure favoring tuskless elephants, those born without tusks or with only small vestigial ones. These elephants are overlooked by poachers, giving them a survival advantage in regions where ivory hunting is rampant. Studies in areas like Mozambique's Gorongosa National Park have revealed the extent of this shift. 
after the country's civil war from 1977 to 1992, during which heavy poaching reduced the elephant population by over 90%, nearly half of the surviving females were tuskless, a dramatic increase compared to pre-war levels. Normally, tusklessness is a rare genetic trait, occurring in only about 2 to 4% of females. But selective pressure from poaching has caused this trait to proliferate. Tusks have historically been vital tools for elephants, used in digging for water, stripping bark from trees, defending against predators and battling rivals. However, in today's world of dwindling populations, the dynamics have shifted. The reduced competition between individuals in smaller elephant populations means that lacking tusks may no longer be the severe disadvantage it once was. In fact, avoiding poachers often provides a much greater survival benefit than tusks ever could. While tusks remain useful for foraging and other natural behaviors, the safety gained from being tuskless now outweighs the loss of these functions in heavily poached regions. Elephants have survived for millions of years, adapting to ice ages, predators, and shifting ecosystems. But their ability to survive humanity's influence remains uncertain. By addressing the root causes of poaching and habitat loss, we can ensure that future generations of elephants are not only safe, but also free to live as nature intended, with or without tusks. Thanks for watching. Please like if you've enjoyed this video and subscribe to join us for more adventures. See you soon.